introduce to you Dr. Janina Fisher. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Amanda. I'm happy to do it. Um, today, we're going to talk about what I call the living legacy of trauma uh, in children based on my book, uh, Transforming the Living Legacy of Trauma. But the legacy of trauma shows up a little bit differently in young people um, than it does in adults. And it's important if we work with children and families that we understand how this living legacy manifests and what we can do to help children. You know, we didn't know when the field began, and I began with the field in the early 1990s, um, we thought that talking about it would be enough, that traumatic events were single events, and if we could help the youth or the adult talk about what had happened, it would somehow resolve just as, as Freud's talking cure was supposed to, to result. We found over the next 10 years as research on trauma and trauma treatment began that actually talking about the event didn't resolve it. Um, and that worse yet, our survivors of trauma, young and old, suffered from a legacy of symptoms. And you'll recognize these symptoms. All the symptoms of major depression, all the symptoms that we associate with PTSD, um, certainly, you know, all the symptoms we associate with ADHD, um, with mistrust, hypervigilance, suspiciousness, um, difficulties, huge difficulties with trust and attachment, substance abuse, self-harm and suicidality, and borderline personality disorder. All of these symptoms are associated with a history of traumatic events. And each one represents a way that a child or an adult tries to survive, tries to cope. Um, because, because children especially have only their own bodies on which to depend. So all of these symptoms use different properties of the brain of the body, of the nervous system, to, to help us survive. And a question I frequently ask adults, uh, and, I could, and certainly I would ask adolescents, is how did the depression help you survive? Right? How did the hopelessness help you survive? How did losing interest help you survive? And usually those are very easy questions for young people and older to answer. Because immediately say, oh, yeah, the depression, that was my cave. I could hide inside it. Um, hopelessness. Well, it was stupid to keep hoping, right? So all these symptoms represent brilliant attempts to survive in a dangerous world. Because remember, in child abuse, in domestic violence, the danger is not just when something is happening. The danger is there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, why don't these symptoms go away when the trauma is over? Why is it a living legacy? And the answer lies in the nature of the brain. This is the very simple model of the brain that I can teach. I can teach young people. 
I can remember it myself as a therapist. This is a model of the brain called the triune brain. And it's very conveniently composed of three parts. The lizard or reptilian brain is this very primitive brain at the back of our heads. That's the part of the brain that, that controls our heart rates, our respiratory function, our instincts, our reflexes, and that's how it speaks. It speaks in impulse and changes in breathing. The emotional brain is this whole area in the center called the limbic system, composed of many different small structures that each have to do with emotions, emotional memory, um, relational memory, all the things that therapists are most interested in and families are most concerned about. Uh, they're also, of course, concerned about this lizard brain. The emotional brain also doesn't have words. It speaks with feelings, gut reactions, simp that nonverbal experience of knowing when you like something and knowing when you don't like something. That's all the emotional brain or limbic system. And then there is the prefrontal cortex, the thinking brain, which develops very, very slowly over the course of childhood. And brain scientists now say that the prefrontal cortex does not stop developing until we're almost 30 years old. So those of you who, who have our family members, staff members, um, when hope, when all is lost, just think, this young person still has a thinking brain that's developing. And as it develops, it's more and more capable of learning from experience, of exercising good judgment, of putting feelings into words instead of actions. But here's the problem when we are exposed to danger and fear. And again, remember that although as a field we focused on individual events, right, that time the child was beaten at the age of five, the fact is that we now know it's the cumulative impact of being constantly under threat the cumulative impact of having our attachment figures become violent and rejected. It, it isn't the single event, single reaction that we once thought. So when we're under threat, the brain, the brain prioritizes threat cues. We see the bad things before we see the good things. You might have noticed that. Um, and the threat cue activates the emotional brain and the lizard brain so that we have a sense of alarm, of fear. And the lizard brain is, is activated to employ survival instincts. And very unfortunately, the prefrontal cortex shuts down because when we're under threat, thinking is very slow and inefficient. So we know actually that traumatized children are more likely to be learning disabled than their age mates who've not been traumatized. So think about the effects on on children's ability to learn in school if the thinking brain keeps shutting down each time they're anxious. Um, it, is, it is a very, very problematic thing. It means no matter what kind of good conversation you've had with a child, 
um, or a teenager, when that child or teenager is is activated, when something stimulates fear, the thinking brain will shut down as if you'd never had that conversation. Needless to say, that's very frustrating for parents and all those who work with these young people. We know that the brain and body are designed so that we pick the safest, most effective defensive response. Um, and in a chronically abusive environment, defensive responses have to be activated every day. So traumatized children often start running away at an early age, um, attacking others, whether it's other children or family members, and attacking their own bodies. And as much as they have moments of wanting so much to be approved of and to be good, quote unquote, when the thinking brain goes offline, they respond impulsively. Usually the child begins to believe, I'm stupid, I'm bad. And adults begin to believe that the child is manipulative, antisocial, borderline. Um, we apply all kinds of pejorative labels to trauma-related behavior. And when the thinking brain shuts down, children can't find the words to explain. Also, in neglectful abusive environments, children sharing their feelings and experience is not a good idea. Um, most often, a child's questions, a child's feelings become a pretext for abuse. So often, young people learn it's best to say nothing. <clears throat> that becomes a problem later on, obviously. Also, <clears throat> think about how long it takes for the brain to develop. You know, I, I always link it to when we stop holding a child's hand. When, at what age we stop getting a babysitter for a child, right? So we hold children's hands routinely uh, when they are under eight or nine. Um, we don't let children stay home alone, usually until they are 11 or 12. So, so we know that's a sign that the thinking brain of the child has developed to the point that we could leave that child without a babysitter. If the thinking brain shuts down each time this young person feels alarmed, um, that child is in trouble and gets misunderstood. You know, the research, which began in the mid-90s, which totally revolutionized our idea of what it meant to be traumatized and what therapists were supposed to do about it, um, we learned from the brain scan research that trauma is primarily remembered as body and emotional memory as sensations, impulses, feelings, um, rather than as a clear chronological narrative. We also know, because we now know much more about brain development, that children don't have a reliable narrative memory until they are nine and above. So often, we expect 
children to be able to remember and talk about things that happened before the age of nine. And we may think that they're withholding or resisting if they don't. But actually, it is very hard. You know, we all know that children, you ask a child, how was school today? And the child says, fine. And But when you ask what happened, it's very hard to get a clear-cut report. So the good news about this, this phenomenon that trauma is remembered non-verbally is, is that it allows us to respond faster. You don't have to think, is this place dangerous? Because your body senses danger and reacts before you have time to think. The problem is that feeling and body memories don't come with a label. They feel like they're relevant to what's happening now. As Dan Siegel says, we act, feel, and imagine without recognition of the influence of past experience on our present reality. And of course, therapists know that, and, and I think often families know that, but, but we have been taught to try to ask the individual to remember a past event rather than understanding it's the influence of the totality of their experience that is really the problem. Body and emotional memories, as I say, don't feel like memories. When a child feels desperate, has an impulse to run away or starts wanting to die, those are often feeling memories. I routinely ask people of all ages, how young were you the first time you thought about dying as a way to escape? And it's remarkable how young children are the first time they think, oh, maybe I could die and then it would be over. All the whole range of anxiety symptoms from panic to anxiety attacks, to phobias, to mistrust, to what I call post-traumatic paranoia, which is the fear of something happening that has already happened. Um, all of those are often memory when they're happening in an environment that's now safe. Many times we'll see young people desperate for help, uh, clinging, um, demanding help, angry at the failure of help, um, pushing adults away, and then demanding help. Very, very confusing sometimes for for both families and staff. Um, but if you think about it, the cry for help is, is a survival response. That that's the first survival response we have as babies. Babies cry. So that desperation for help can often be a memory. The anger, the rage, the impulse to run, um, destroying objects, kicking, hitting, biting, the whole range of violent behavior can be memory. Because so often, um, when children are now safe with their biological families, with foster and adoptive families, they don't feel safe because those body and emotional memories persist. Um, shame, depression, hopelessness, self-hatred, all of those can be memories. The, the wish to hide in the bed, 
to not want to get out of bed, to keep going back to bed. Those can be memories. Think of them as behavioral memories, because often that was the one safe place. So, you know, we are mammals. So we have all of the same instincts. We're not as good at fighting as animals are, which might be why human beings have, have developed weapons. We're not as fast on our feet. We're better at crying for help because we have words. Um, we submit. We can't quite play dead like this possum, but we have the same submission response that animals have and the same freeze like a deer in the headlights response. And those response, responses continue to be activated for years and years after the young person is safe, right? That's the living legacy. Because historically, if you think about the cavemen and women, the cavemen and women who reacted quicker to the possibility of danger lived long enough to become our ancestors. Now, the other thing that happens is that, is that we develop habits, or our nervous systems develop habits of reacting to the environment based on our experience. And, and if we are going to have a robust, resilient nervous system, it takes good attachment. Um, wonderful for children who are raised in safe, secure environments. Not so good for children who experience danger at an early age. So this is a very simple model of the nervous system that I can explain to a child, I can explain to an older adult, I can explain to a teenager. Um, and as a general rule, obviously you change your language depending on the age of the individual, but I explain that we all have nervous systems or we all have bodies is what I would say to a younger person capable of very high activation that gives us enough energy to run for miles to, to be that little old lady who fights off her attacker with her cane, um, enough energy to leap tall buildings at a single bound, um, we really have the strength of Superman when we have that high sympathetic activation. And we have bodies capable of very low activation, as in a medically induced coma, in hypothermia, where our bodies go into the lowest energy state compatible with human life. And hypothermia helps us to survive. It helps us to endure. So does a medically induced coma. That low activation state is a necessity in situations in which we're trapped. Um, prisoners of war, hostages, um, all. You know, think about the... Um, all of the Ukrainians trapped in the shelters um, and, uh, and in the factory um, and, and having that low activation state helps people to endure unbearable conditions. But again, I can explain this to children, right? I could say, checked out for low activation or hyper for high activation, whatever language makes sense to the child. 
And then I explain that in the middle is what we call the window of tolerance. And that's the window within which we can tolerate our feelings. Feelings are okay. Um, whether they're very intense, as in anger and fear, whether the feelings are very low, as in depression or fatigue. And, and that window of tolerance is crucial, because if we have a window of tolerance, we don't become impulsive, we don't act out, because we can tolerate whatever we feel. And the problem is that we get that wide, resilient window of tolerance from our parents, from our families, when we are exposed to safety. So if we're very, very, very upset, if we're down, tired, bored, not feeling well, Someone picks us up, dries our tears, makes us laugh, reassures and comforts us, and returns our little bodies to that window of tolerance. Um, parents know this cycle well um, because it seems to repeat endlessly. It takes a very wide window of tolerance on the part of a parent to keep responding to the tears, to the I'm bored, um, by, by soothing and regulating the child, cheering up this child, calming this child down, so that the nervous system begins to develop the habit, being upset and calming down, being in a very low mood and cheering up. We don't, you know, we don't just have those abilities at birth, as, as you know, anyone who's been around infants knows. We are not born with those abilities. We develop them. And the problem is that when we are threatened, um, the window of tolerance doesn't have a chance to grow because being in a threatening, dangerous environment means that the nervous system is turned on to high arousal um, or in a chronic state of low arousal. And so we have young people who don't have very much of a window of tolerance. I say, I often describe people as having a window of tolerance the size of a toothpick. They can't think and feel at the same time because, because their windows of tolerance are so narrow that the prefrontal cortex, the thinking brain, keeps shutting down. So what we see are children, young people with too much arousal who are emotionally reactive. That's an understatement. They're impulsive. They're highly sensitive to rejection, um, but quick to push people away if they feel uh, defensive. Um, Hypervigilance. Um, distrust, suspiciousness, um, often accompanied by lots of anxiety, difficulty sleeping, nightmares, sometimes flashbacks, um, and too much arousal is what results in hyperactive behavior, in chronic restlessness, and also it fuels impulsive, aggressive behavior. Any type of impulsive behavior is the result of too much arousal. You know, so often um, young people and adults 
are accused of intentionally behaving badly. But it's very hard to intentionally behave badly because it takes that energy that only high arousal can give us. Um, and then we have children, young people, who suffer from too little arousal. They are checked out, tuned out, um, often appear emotionless. If you ask, they're numb. Uh, often this group, the too little arousal group, becomes addictive to video games, um, at, which actually becomes then a place where they can uh, withdraw and disconnect um, um, without appearing to be, um, what, social misfits. Um, you see the too little arousal in their difficulty thinking and talking or making an effort because this parasympathetic low arousal state robs us of energy. It becomes an effort to stand up, to walk across the room, to get out of bed. And so what can appear like resistance or what we call passive aggressiveness is actually caused by the nervous system. It isn't actually passive aggressive. It's actually, I mean, physiologically, you can't be passive and aggressive at the same time. But I think this group, the too little arousal group, is so passive that it makes us feel aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> and and so we use this term passive aggressive to describe them. Um, they don't care, not because they don't care. They don't care because they're numb. And you need feelings to be able to care. This group can't care because the emotions are so big that empathy is is lost. Um, the too little group can appear resistant, um, but we have to remember that it's really the nervous system resisting, not the child. And then, and then very importantly, I'm going to keep saying this because it's something that, that um, so often is forgotten. We can't put words to our feelings without the thinking brain, right? Because the area of the brain that allows us to have, <coughs> excuse me, allows us to express ourselves is inhibited when the prefrontal cortex shuts down, as it does when there's too much arousal or too little. Again, we may see that as defiance or resistance, but if this young person is not in the window of tolerance, this part of the brain is offline. And as a result, this young person can't learn, can't think, um, and can't express themselves. One of the most important things for families and staff to understand is what we call triggers and triggering. That's the word that we've used in the field for, for decades, as long as I've been in the field, which is 41 years. But actually triggering is a brain and body reaction. The human brain, from about six months of age on, preferentially notices threats, um, notices the negative um, before the positive. We're born with brains that prioritize the negative. If 
we have been exposed to threat, if we've been hurt, abused, frightened, the that negativity bias, that that tendency to see the threat first and the safety second, that becomes more and more sensitized. And we become incredibly sensitive to any danger signal remotely connected to the traumatic environment, not just to the events, the traumatic environment, right? Times of day, right? So often the times of day um, that are difficult for young people are the times of day they were most in danger. The days of the week also can be very triggering. Um, maybe it was safer in school, and so weekends are harder. Maybe school was not a safe place. Um, seasons of the year, weather conditions, all can. I remember I did a workshop for the Department of Massachusetts um, Division of Mental Health um, for um, adolescents in residential treatment. This was probably 10 years ago. And 50 or 60 adolescents with their counselors showed up for this workshop. And I remember I had, I had in the middle, I had each of them go into groups of three and start to write down lists of what triggered them. And the, and the lists I got back were heartbreaking. Things like snow, rain, um, the smell of cigarette smoke, um, the, the uh, cool, crisp air of fall. So many, many things that were so normal. And then I began to be curious, why is it that snow and rain are so triggering? And I realized, oh, when it's snowing, when it's raining, children are, are kept inside and therefore exposed to potentially threatening people. Um, now, when children are triggered, they experience these alarm responses, but they don't know that those alarm responses are memory. And usually the adults don't know either. We just know that the child has overreacted. And, and we don't realize that that overreaction means the child's emotions and body are remembering and the feeling the child has is a feeling of danger. I remember George Boyd was a young man at this uh, workshop for adolescents, and he came up to me at the break and handed me a piece of paper. And he said, I, I thought you should have this. And I said, George, do you want me to use your name when I teach people this? And he said, yes, I'd feel very proud. And he'd written trauma. Triggers equals remembering all unneeded memories at once. Right? That sensitivity is an additional trauma for young people. Imagine so often the trauma exposure ended when the child was five or six or ten or even as young as a year of age. But the sensitivity to triggering keeps those responses happening again and again and again, which George Boyd knew all too well. Um, and, and really the why we had the workshop, because we had a feeling that these adolescents were old enough to understand all this material that I'm sharing with you and that it might help them 
to understand um, and manage themselves a little bit better. So here are some of the most common triggers for children. One of the saddest, saddest things to me about, about childhood trauma is that it results in all human beings being triggering. Um, right, and this is true with adults. We see it with, with individuals of all ages. If the child was abused in the context of family, their current family members will be triggering. Not because you've done anything, but because the closeness of the relationship is tied to what happened in the past. All the bad places, um, holidays, birthdays, often very triggering. Um, disappointment, so often trauma survivors talk about how triggered they get by being disappointed or being told no. And, and often that's misinterpreted as entitlement or as bad behavior. Um, but actually it makes sense because in a traumatic environment, children are disappointed over and over and over again. And so often in the, in the abusive families that I've had contact with or heard about, often the child was promised a birthday party, a trip to the park, something special. And then some pretext is used to punish the child by taking away that, that promise, right? Talk about disappointment. Um, eye contact can be very triggering. Being ignored. Uh, there's so many of these that are opposites. Being spoken to, being asked to have a conversation, very triggering. There's never a good conversation in a traumatic world. Being ignored is triggering. Being alone is triggering, but so is being part of a group. Um, being unable to go out is triggering. Having to go out is triggering. Failure is triggering. Success is triggering. I have a, a client who says, I think, I think my mother was threatened by the successes of her children. If we were happy, if we did well in school, we could count on things being much, much worse. Um, criticism clearly is triggering. Being asked questions is triggering. Um, meal times often very, very triggering because meal times in in abusive families can be nightmares in the context of domestic violence. Meal times can be dangerous times. So many of these things are are daily events. When I think about raising my own children, I disappointed them many times a day. No, we can't have cookies before dinner. No, we, and, but luckily it wasn't triggering for them, right? These are very normal things. Having to sit still, for instance, in school, very natural, normal part of how we help children to manage um, classroom situations, social situations, very triggering for children who've been traumatized. So I call this the post-traumatic roller coaster. Um, and often it feels like a wild ride for families, for therapists, for residential staff. And it all begins because young people are triggered by so many natural, normal, everyday things. Um, when they're triggered, 
they become overwhelmed, they become desperate, they become impulsive, the thinking brain shuts down. And what happens usually is the children either blame themselves or they blame the adults around them. Okay? And both have prices attached to them. But if you blame yourself or if you blame others, it actually makes it worse. Of course, without a thinking brain, the child is not going to think, oh, I better not blame it on myself or my family. Because that requires quite a sophisticated thinking brain. But blaming yourself or blaming those who are trying to help you increases the fear and distrust of others, which increases the overwhelming feelings. And most children and adults at some point find that some kind of impulsive behavior brings relief. Um, brings relief from the thoughts, brings relief from the feelings. Usually, the impulsive behavior is discovered accidentally um, at a fairly young age. And then, unfortunately, when the child is criticized or punished for the impulsive behavior, it triggers more fear, more mistrust, more anger, which triggers more defiance, more impulsive behavior, more self-injury, more aggressive behavior, um, or more shutdown. And then finally, the only thing left is hoping for death. Because the fear of the emotions is much, much more frightening than the fear of dying. And that's something that is so important to understand about young people with eating disorders that are life-threatening, with suicidal behavior that's life-threatening. We have to remember, this young person is not afraid of dying. This young person is afraid of feeling for good reason because this young person doesn't have a window of tolerance so the feelings feel as if they are unparable so we have to help young people recognize triggering because not knowing that their behavior is has been triggered. They hear words like, that was inappropriate, that's not safe, that's not okay, and they feel misunderstood. Okay? They don't understand. Um, you know, they don't understand why we don't understand. And we don't understand. <laughs> Why they don't understand that what they're doing is unsafe and inappropriate. There's no way for them to know that their behavior is inappropriate and unsafe because that takes a thinking brain. And, and so we don't understand and they don't understand that their thinking brains are not working. Um... You know, triggered reactions um, are, are very familiar to me, but I find that triggered reactions tend to be puzzling for most people, certainly for families, certainly for children, and even sometimes for staff. Um, and especially when children have what I call domino effects. They get triggered by something and they might respond first with anger. And then that triggers fear, right? And when we have the fear of what? We don't 
fear is not a logical emotion. Um, it might be that anger was so dangerous when the child was in the traumatic environment that it's scary. Um, and then they might get triggered by the fear into a shame state or, or triggered by the reaction of adults into a shame state in which they're unable to talk. The next time somebody makes you feel ashamed, notice one of the first things that happens when, we're, when we feel shame is we lose the ability to speak. And so often we see children and uh, really people of all ages respond impulsively from a fight response place, then go into fear or shame or both. And, and so the first thing we have to do is we have to help young people recognize that they're triggered, to recognize the role of triggering. And we have to help families and step with top of ourselves recognize this is just triggering. It may be infuriating, the consequences may be frightening, but, but triggering is, a, is an instinctive response of the brain and body. It is not deliberate. And so the key, you know, it's very interesting to me that young people, when they start consistently being reminded that they're triggered, um, when we, when we help them by saying, ooh, I think I just triggered you before they act out. Um, when we help them to see the triggered reactions are not bad, but, but recognizing triggering, recognizing triggers is essential. Otherwise, um, these things will, this vicious circle will keep happening. They'll keep acting impulsively. Adults will react with limits and criticism. Um, and that will trigger the young person again and even more. So we have to, we have to interpret the behavior of young people because they can't, they can't. You know, because trauma is remembered primarily non-verbally, young people can't say, um, um, I don't feel safe having a conversation with you. Or if they do, it's usually in anger. So we have to remember that the emotional reactivity or the defensiveness or the mistrust or, and, and especially those, um, I know that feeling, you can't say anything to this child. Um, because whatever you say triggers that emotional reactivity, defensiveness, or mistrust. But really, that's a, a high arousal symptom. Um, running away, there's running away, but Often, often the flight response leads children to walk away from conversations or to threaten to leave um, um, or pushing other people away. You know, we can push people away aggressively. That's a fight response. We can push others away by distancing, by shutting down. And there are a million ways that the traumatized kids have learned to run away. I, I remember I was giving I was giving a staff training at a residential program for children 
if I recall, between the ages of eight and 12. And I was in the living room of this residential program, um, putting, setting up my projector, getting ready to show a PowerPoint. And these two boys who looked to be around 10 or 11 wandered in. And it was clear they were curious. Uh, and they said, hey, what? I, we don't know you. What are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm here. I'm setting up a classroom for your staff. I'm going to be their teacher today. And then I said, what do you think they need? What do you think I need to teach them? And they looked at each other and they just walked away without saying anything. And I thought, hmm, that's odd. And uh, and I went back to setting up my classroom. And a little while later, they wandered back through the living room. And I said to them, hey, guys, you know, come over here because I need your help. And And they came over and I said, you know, I don't know your staff. I don't know this place. I have to teach your staff something. And I don't know what they need. Um, so could you guys help me out? What do, you, what do you think your staff needs from me today? And they, they looked at me and they said, they need to learn not to freak out when we freak out. <laughs> and I realized that they hadn't answered the question the first time because Questions can be a trap in an abusive environment. The wrong answer results in abuse. So they they ran away. They simply walked away from the conversation. And and then when I said, "Hey, hey guys, I need your help," um, somehow that made it okay to stay and and tell people. What actually was very helpful for their staff, and the staff really loved it. Um, the child who's fidgety, that can't sit still, has to constantly be moving. That's hyperarousal. The whole range of aggressive, violent behavior from self injury to aggressive behavior toward others, whether it's verbal, or physical, all that driven by sympathetic hyperarousal. The inability to, to, to tolerate frustration, um, the rejection sensitivity, the temper tantrums, you know, what we call temper tantrums in young people is a fight response. And, um, and it's very, very interesting to look at what triggers that those temper tantrums, because that's part of the young person's story. The nightmares, the inability to sleep at night, the fears, the nighttime fears are part of their story. Um, and, and often um, the result is that Children are getting out of bed and going to try to find family members or staff, not because they're being disobedient, but because they're triggered and afraid. Hypoarousal, too little arousal. Um, you see in the child who's withdrawn, shut down, and disconnected. And, and of course, you can have both because some triggers will trigger too much arousal, some triggers will trigger the opposite. The shutdown response, the numbing response, the withdrawal. Different, but you know, the withdrawal is different than, than flight behavior because the withdrawal is more like collapse. It isn't, you know, when those two boys uh, just looked at each other and walked away, um, that was a flight response. Um, withdrawal would have been, they stood there and you could see the 
instead of the shades closing. Um, the lack of energy or motivation is not, it's not intentional. If the nervous system doesn't give us the energy, it's very hard to move. Um, that's why low energy is a symptom of depression. Um, it's hard to want to do something if you're in a numb state. And, and so it's very, very hard to feel like you can motivate a child in this state because there's nothing that young person wants. By the way, not wanting anything is a very adaptive survival response. And that may be part of the story that the symptoms are telling. Um, the numbness, right? Sometimes I ask very numb young people, can you feel your feet? <laughs> and they look at me like I'm nuts. Of course I can feel my feet. <laughs> but I said, oh, phew. Oh, I'm so relieved. I, I wasn't sure if you were, you know, I wasn't sure if you were in, if your body was numb too the withdrawal the tendency to isolate is an expression of fear or shame right why else do we withdraw um it's again withdrawal looks different than a flight response um passivity you know, the low energy, the very, the too little arousal leads to an inability to defend oneself. And so often these kids with too little arousal are bullied. They're, they're taken advantage of in all kinds of ways. And, and often, understandably, a family's reaction is, stand up to yourself. <laughs> and the difficulty is that if we seem critical, um, we're going to trigger more passivity. Uh, and so that becomes very challenging for families, right? Because sometimes you want to shake the kids with too little arousal. <laughs> say something uh, but unfortunately that's going to trigger more shutdown many kids have what i call symptoms related to the persistent expectation of danger these are young people who are afraid to be alone um, they may also be afraid to be in social situations Right? Remember that the triggering often is paradoxical. They can be afraid to go to school. They can be afraid to go on any kind of outing. Um, because being out in the big world, um, when your brain tells you that it's a dangerous world filled with dangerous people, that's very frightening. The inability to trust is related to the persistent expectation of danger. The tendency to not want to talk about feelings or anything personal, right? That's a symptom of distrust. Abusive families really take advantage of any personal disclosure by children to punish them. And, and so the symptom makes perfect sense, right? You just give your name, rank, and serial number. You don't share anything that could become a pretext for violence. And then we have in adolescence particularly um, reenactment symptoms sexual acting out, aggressive symptoms, um, 
and that punitive tone of voice that often is very much like the tone that this young person may have heard from the abuser. And, and those symptoms are very hard for families. Um, probably much, much harder than the persistent expectation of danger symptoms. Um, the thing to remember is that these are not intentional conscious actions. You know, people say to me all the time, what do you mean it's not intentional, right? My, my daughter hoarded razor blades. That's intentional. And I always say, remember, these young people are intentional like a tiger or a cheetah. It's an instinctive intentionality. It's not the intentionality of a thinking brain. And, and my experience is that these behaviors are so much less frustrating when we think of them as intentional, like a cheetah. Dissociative symptoms are rarely talked about, but are so common in young people. Um, right? We may again think this is intentional behavior when the young person talks in a faraway voice or seems to be in a daze or is simply shut down and we can't reach them. Um, another dissociative symptom, um, again, not on a consistent basis, there is a loss of memory for conversations you know you've had, events that you and other family or staff have, have witnessed, um, despite all evidence to the contrary. The young person says, no, no, that didn't happen, or I didn't do that. And we can think of that as manipulative, or we can be curious. Maybe it's dissociative. And of course, the most striking dissociative symptom, this young person seems like different people at different times. Um, and so you, you never know which, which side of this young person you're going to get. Are you going to get the, the thoughtful, insightful side? Are you going to get the frightened side? Are you going to get the angry side, the clinging side? Um, and that becomes very confused. My experience is that I, I would always be talking to the side of the client that, that I was talking to a few minutes ago, and now I'm talking to a different side. So it gets very confusing for family and staff. So, um, Maybe, maybe I'm just thinking that maybe this would be a good place to answer uh, a few questions. Um, so we'll take, take a little pause. <coughs> and, uh, yeah. and let's see what's in the Q&A box. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Fisher. Yeah, we have a few questions here. Um, so I will just read out a few and you can answer at your leisure. So the first one, and actually something that I was wanting to clarify as well, is um, the definition of a traumatic event. I know we're talking a lot about big, what people might consider big T traumas, and is there a spectrum? What do we need to think about when we're thinking about traumatic events? Well, the definition of trauma that I use um, is an, a very importantly, not just an event, an event, a series of events, or a set of conditions. Child abuse is a set of conditions. Domestic violence is a set of conditions. War is a set of conditions. Um, racial trauma is a set of conditions. 
right? It is very rare for young people to have had single events. Most of the young people that we're going to see were um, lived in a set of conditions. And then the second criteria is that the effect of those conditions overwhelms the capacity of the individual, so obviously age-related, um, to cope, to comprehend, to stay present. And thirdly, um, the event or conditions must subjectively feel like a threat to life and or sanity. So having, you know, having emotionally neglectful parents is very distressing for children, but it's not traumatic. Um, you know, having very, very critical parents or even a parent who has trouble with anger, the, we have to ask, was that parent frightening? And some young people will say, oh, yeah, my, you know, my stepfather was so frightening. Or they might say, nah, you know, he would just get angry, but we knew he would never hurt us, right? That can be distressing to have a parent who's angry. But when you feel safe, that's not trauma. Um, so the key is, um, was this, were the circumstances frightening? You know, think about war. Um, Right, we can be in wartime, as the Ukrainians are now. Um, but the uh, the sense of threat is there, whether or not we're actually under gunfire or bombs right this minute. Just, I'm sure, if if I were in any of the surrounding countries, I'd be scared. Right, I think most Europeans feel fear, um, right? So um, even if we're not the victim, this happens in domestic violence, where children are not necessarily the victims, but they're exposed. Um, if it's frightening and overwhelming, that's trauma. Um, and I think, unfortunately, the term developmental trauma has become very confusing. Originally, the term developmental trauma applied to child abuse, not to neglect or to hurtful behavior, but to actual traumatic um, experience. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Um, I have another question here. It says, is it okay for a child to hold on to the trauma as anger when they are older? Is it better for the child to avoid contact with a nuclear family if they hold on to that anger? Well, you know, that's a great question because hold, holding on to anger isn't a choice, right? If, I'm, you know, I have to, can't, I think the, the only time I can think of that people consciously and intentionally try to hold on to some anger is, for example, victims of domestic violence, they try to hold on to some anger to keep the boundaries between them and their abusers clear. Most of the time, anger is either triggered or it's not triggered. And anger is part of the fight response. Um, and it's very, very different to feel angry than to have a fight response that is accompanied by intense anger as part of the fight response. Um, so um, young people who have frequent fight responses, as many do, are not holding on to their anger. They're triggered and, and some of them may feel safer when they're angry, but it doesn't mean that they're holding on to it. Okay. 
Thank you. It's an important distinction to make between. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Thank right. you. Um, another question, and this is really pertinent to the work that we're doing at Pine River. We see a lot of children and adolescents whose families are not necessarily the source of the abuse or the neglect, um, but perhaps they've experienced some bullying or sexual assault or something else outside of their family system. Um, so is the brain response similar to what you've been describing in these cases? And then further to that, how can we help families who may be feeling the blame mm-hmm. of being the bad parents when they're not the ones um, to point the finger at. Absolutely. And it's so, I think it's so hard because parents often blame themselves when children are traumatized by non-family or extended family. I mean, in my, I've worked with hundreds of people who were abused by uncles, grandfathers, in the context of having a perfectly safe nuclear family. There were members of the extended family who were very dangerous, um, or they were abused by neighbors, teachers, um, members of the religious community. Um, And it's very, very hard for parents, I think. And, And I'm glad that you mentioned that because it's, I think it's so important to be clear that um, that families can be very protective and yet um, people who are going to exploit children do it anyway. Okay. Should we take a couple more questions? Is sure, that- sure. Yeah. yeah. We have a lot coming in. So um, this one is in reference to triggers. Uh, and it's something that I was thinking about as well. When you put up that that slide of all the things that may trigger someone, it felt just very, um, there's a lot on there. Holidays, weather, things that we're not going to be able to mitigate. So how do we as parents respect a trigger, let's say, for example, a holiday, um, when we still want to celebrate that holiday in our home? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I think, um, again, it's hard because because getting, really growing the ability to manage triggers is hard for adults. And so it's doubly hard for young people because their, you know, their brains are still developing and they don't have, um, they don't have the ability even when their brains are thinking brain is online. So anticipating triggers um, certainly is very, very helpful. Um, try, you know, I think in terms of things like holidays um, or family meals, if there are ways to make them different than the holiday or family meal that is connected to danger. That can be very helpful. Um, Giving, you know, one of the things that really is interesting is giving choices. Like, you know, would you like to eat with us or would you like to eat in your room? Um, That can be very hard for a family to do because of course, what do you want at a family meal or a holiday is you wanna all be together. Um, But giving a young person choices is the opposite of trauma. And so often when given a choice, the thinking brain comes online. And even if the young person doesn't make the choice we want, um, they have had a little victory over triggering. So it takes, you know what I think also it's, Again, I totally empathize with parents. It takes saying to yourself and to the child over and over again, I know you were triggered. Um, But we have to figure out something else to do when you're triggered. Um, And, and, you know, sharing this, the window of tolerance concept as a family, I think, 
is really is really helpful right because i remember as a parent i remember saying to my kids i didn't know about the window of tolerance in those days but i remember having long stressful days at work and coming home and saying to my kids hey guys mom had a very tiring day i had a rough day and i just want you to know in advance my patience is not going to be great tonight <laughs> so just just giving you guys the heads up um so that and then if i got angry i would be easier to say you know i'm sorry i told you that i didn't have much ability to be patient and i don't <laughs> so because we can't be perfect parents with traumatized kids and that won't heal the trauma understanding very helpful um having that per a perspective as a family very very helpful yeah and i imagine that also offers really good modeling for our kids as well to be able to say i had a really bad day at school and i don't have much patience right now <laughs> right 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 i was just thinking we can have a window of tolerance temperature taking <laughs> right <laughs> at various times of day <laughs> um, great. So there's another question here about uh, a trauma response and whether being more emotional or more empathic after a trauma is its own trauma response and how a family could lessen that. Um, let's see, I wonder, um, I'm not quite sure what emotional and empathic might be describing. Hmm. Just, yeah, it just says, is being a more emotional and empathic person after experiencing a trauma, could that be considered a trauma response? Um, you know, I, I, certainly more emotional for sure, because, because think of the role of, of high sympathetic arousal, that's going to make anybody more emotional. Um, you know, I, it's interesting because empathy theoretically is related to the development of the limbic system between the ages of three to 12 months. And so, um, you know, and I also think some of it's temperamental because I think some of us just naturally have more empathy than others. What traumatized kids can have is um a lack of of a screen right a lack of of kind of internal boundaries that allow them to not be affected by the feelings of others right and i think that all has to do with it's adaptive if you're in a dangerous situation to sense how the other person is feeling um, so sometimes traumatized kids have what we could call too much empathy. <clears throat> they don't have, you know, a screening function. That's interesting because there's a lot of um, posting on social media about empaths and, and being an empath and as though it's this wonderful um, mm -hmm. gift that people have been given. And I often think of it as just being someone that has or boundaries or a lack of self. So I'm glad that well, you. I think, you know, I think, I mean, this is something that, that, uh, that therapists and staff have to deal with too, is you want enough empathy, but not too much. Mm -hmm. right? We, it's not going to help young people for us to be overwhelmed. And that's hard as parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you address the low arousal child as an adult when they have never admitted the extent of the effect of the trauma on their lives, or maybe haven't even acknowledged that they have experienced a trauma? Mm -hmm. But somebody has, or, or we wouldn't know <clears throat> as parents that this was a child who'd been traumatized. What seems to be the most helpful thing is for adults to acknowledge that trauma took place. And I think that's 
true actually with older people, not just young people, right? If we acknowledge the trauma without asking the individual to remember it, because remembering stimulates all the feeling and body memories. And I, I actually just uh, two weeks ago spoke at the annual trauma conference in Boston where um, where scientists, neuroscientists actually underscored the point that asking people to talk about the events is actually counterproductive. So much better to just acknowledge because you went through so many bad things, you know, because so many bad things happened to you, because it was so scary, um, because your, your biological family was in a safe place. Acknowledgement is great. I mean, you know, kids need a context in which to put things because they don't have a thinking brain that's well enough to developed to do that. Yeah, and I'm just noticing that the uh, the question about uh, the son who feels traumatized by incorrect psychiatric treatment. And I think it's very, very important. Um, you know, there's there's sort of a loyalty code in the mental health world that we're not supposed to speak ill of other, of colleagues. But I think it's true and I, I feel part of it. We didn't know how to work with trauma. There is still a huge, huge gap in between what we know of as trauma-informed care and traditional mental health uh, treatment. And as a result, many, many young people um, got re-traumatized by the care they received, many adults as well. And I can, for those of us in the trauma field, I can only say we've been working as hard as we can to provide good treatment. But trauma is so complex and it's affecting, you know, it's affecting parts of the brain that we can't see and we can't talk to. And, um, and I think it really is helpful to acknowledge to young people that, that they haven't always had good treatment. And rather than thinking of it as, as their problem, uh, as they're um, having unrealistic expectations or um, entitlement. Yeah, thank you for picking up on that one. Yeah, yeah. So maybe we should go back and, and uh, finish um, the, uh, the next section, but we'll come back because I'm sure we'll have, we'll have time to, um, to answer more questions. And, um, so let me go back to, so let's talk about trauma informed ways of dealing with young people. Um, and, uh, again, keeping, you know, keeping in mind that, um, that, uh, it's, it's hard. There's no one way that works for everyone. And that's, uh, very, very challenging, whether you're a parent or whether you're staff. So, we have to think about the basic assumptions. We have to remember it's normal under conditions of trauma for the brain and the body to become self-protective, for patterns to develop in which there is a stimulus, a trigger, the thinking brain shuts down, and we automatically go into one or more of the survival defenses. And, and they happen quickly, 
right? That's that's the nature of the uh, of the human stress response or the mammalian stress response is there's a trigger and there's an immediate reaction um, that's very intense that often comes out of the blue. And so without a thinking brain online, without the brain development that we that young people eventually will have, um, there is no way for children to know why they're doing what they're doing. Very, very important for us to remember. The brain of young people is not well enough developed to answer a why question until we're over 13. And I would actually say over 15, because a why question is a conceptual question, right? It's putting together ideas to make a concept of why. The brain is very slow to develop that ability to form concepts. Um, and so when children say, I don't know, they probably really don't know, <laughs> right? And, and so I can think of so many families who are so frustrated because they can't get a clear answer to the question, why did you do that? And the reason is that it's a question that the young person can't answer. Um, because human beings are triggering if you've been hurt by human beings, right? Car, cars are triggering if you've been harmed in a car accident, um, right? Um, in wartime, after a war experience, loud noises, weapons, sudden movements um, are going to be triggering. Um, human beings are also going to be triggering. So we have this problem. The child has had a, a defensive response, has acted impulsively. We have to do something. And whatever we do is likely to be triggering, especially if we have to do it while the child is still in a high activation state. So to the extent that we're able, and it's not always possible, um, it's actually better to give kids time for their nervous systems to recalibrate. <clears throat> before we delivered the bad news about the consequences of their action. Um, because if we, if we try to communicate, okay, you're grounded. Okay, this is, you know, I'm taking away your phone um, and your TV privileges. If we communicate those limits while the child's prefrontal cortex is shut down, and the child is in high arousal, um, we're gonna trigger that child. And that child is gonna be unable to process the, the limits that are natural and normal to set. So, <clears throat> so often, you know, often we, <clears throat> excuse me, as parents or as staff members, when there has been some type of dangerous or inappropriate behavior, we feel the impulse to do or say something right away, understandably. Um, if, when possible, it's better to be able to communicate those limits and consequences when there is a calmer state. Right? Remember that your young person developed symptoms that represented the best possible adaptation 
for that child in that situation, whatever that situation might have been. Um, the right, their nervous systems were going to become chronically hyper or hypo aroused, again, depending on the situation. Uh, I'm thinking right now of, of some of the uh, young adults that I've seen over the years. Uh, one who was abused by the father of her best friend, a neighbor. Um, another who was abused by a neighbor. Um, um, so many, you know, another who was abused by um, an uncle, um, by a grandfather. Um, I worked for 20 years with mothers of abused children. Um, most of the children were um, adolescents or young adults. Um, and often these children had been abused by, by some family member. And what I learned was how clever abusers are at hiding their tracks, because these were mothers who sincerely had no idea of what was going on behind their backs. And, and, and really were doing all they could to create safety and, and nurturing for their children. Um, needless to say, they didn't understand why the child was reacting to them, not understanding that triggering meant that any adult whose behavior triggered the young person was going to see those fighting, fleeing behaviors. Um, the desperate need for help, I can remember so many of the mothers had young adult children who were often desperate for help. And if the mother said, I'm so sorry, I'm at work, I can't do anything right now, they would get rage because the I can't help you would trigger the fight response. Um, and so that sensitivity to triggers invariably means that the young person is constantly experiencing too many false alarms, right? The nervous system is responding, even though it's just a trigger. It's just a mother saying, sorry, honey, I'm at work. I can't leave work right now. Um, so very, very, very hard. The triggered emotions and thoughts and body reactions and impulses are misinterpreted by the traumatized person as an indication that they're still in danger. And even when in, in adults and older teenagers, there is a cognitive understanding, I know I'm safe. Um, their bodies don't know that. Um, I remember I'm thinking back to a to Lewis, who was a, a 17 year old when I treated him many years ago. After after being finally removed from his abusive family when he was 14 or 15. Um, he was placed in a foster family with a foster mother from heaven who really had enormous patience for Lewis. Um, I was seeing Lewis because I was working in the school <laughs> where he was constantly in trouble. And I remember he said to me one day, he said, he said, you know, I love my foster mother. I am so lucky that I got this family, but I don't know how to tell them 
that there are actually some good things about being neglected. Like you never have a bedtime, you never have a meal time, you never have to do anything. Nobody ever tells you you can't go out. You go in and out as you like. And and he said, so I don't know what to do because I'm having a hard time giving up that control. So poor Lewis was triggered each time his foster mom said, you're late for dinner. Each time she said, you can't go out. It's eight o'clock at night. It's time to do your homework and get ready for bed. That was triggering. He knew that he was being difficult and he felt badly. But as he said, you know, I got, nobody ever told me what to do in my old family. So past and present get confused. And um, and it's a struggle for young people. I've appreci always appreciated Lewis because he had the perspective and he taught me something that has helped countless others. We have to remember that our most well-intentioned effort to help will be triggering if we have a disapproving look. Now, it's hard not to have a disapproving look sometimes um, or a negative tone of voice. Um, that's very hard when the behavior has been so unacceptable or so disturbing. Um, we don't realize that the word you can be triggering because in abusive relationships, you is never a good word. You know, I think about my grandchildren. You has been such a positive word in their lives because they've heard things like, you are so smart. You are so cute. That, you know, you look beautiful today. And, and so you is a very easy, very positive word. But you get over here, you idiot. I'll show you. That's the word you um, that so many traumatized children have heard. So it becomes triggering. Why questions can be triggering if the child can't answer them? Um, so also there are studies that show that traumatized individuals um, often misinterpret facial expressions as angry when they're not. So you may be tired. You may be frustrated. You might be preoccupied with something besides this young person. Um, you might be trying to look serious because you want to make the point that this was a serious event. Keep in mind that that traumatized children are very, very simple. They're really hypervigilant, not just sensitive to facial expression because survival depended on their reading facial expression. So the more we can be curious, again, I say that understanding how hard it is to be curious when something very disturbing has occurred. Um, curiosity slows the nervous system. It, it really stimulates the thinking brain. Consistency reduces fear. The more consistent we can be, the, the better it is. You know, I, I notice in myself, the more hyper-aroused a young person or an adult is, the slower I talk. Um, and probably it's the opposite with people who are very shut down. Um, in working with young people, 
remember where they are in their brain development. Um, right? Think children younger than 13 or 14 are not capable of learning from experience yet. Right? It's, and because that takes a lot of brain development to learn from experience. That's a concept. Oh, I did that before and it didn't work out well. I don't want to do it this time. Um, and of course, when the prefrontal cortex shuts down, all the skills, all the plans, all the agreements that we've worked so hard to establish with young people are out the window because they can't retrieve the skills, they can't retrieve the plan that they agreed to. Now, um, this goes back to what I said earlier. The neuroscience research has now very clearly established that talking about the events stimulates the feeling and body memories so that if this child is struggling with triggering and with what, what impulsive behavior gets triggered, this is not the time to talk about the events. It's a good time to acknowledge, I know, I know this is really triggering for you, right? Of course you got triggered, right? Now we just have to figure out how, how, what to do so you don't hurt yourself when you get triggered. Um, very, very, very important. And try to use what I call trauma logic, because trauma logic is different from rational logic, right? We have to assume that all the mundane, normal daily events, even positive things, trigger the traumatized nervous system and trigger those fight, flight, freeze, submit, and cry for help responses. Even positive things. I've, I've worked a lot with special education teachers, teaching them about trauma. And they often remark that progress, success in learning seems to trigger um, reactivity in their students. Makes perfect sense, right? If I think about my client, Annie, who said, yeah, I think my mother was triggered when we did well, because when we were happy and successful, she beat us even harder. Assume that the lizard brain will take over. Don't be surprised by it. Of course, it's upsetting. I, you know, I think it's so hard. Um, but if we assume that the lizard brain will take over, we're not going to be as shocked and horrified. Um, assume that the impulsive behavior is not intentional, that it's, it is, it's lizard brain, right? <laughs> right? Think of a lizard, right? A lizard just reacts. And assume that your attempts to set limits or, or even attempts to help can be triggering and may be misperceived not through any fault of your own, but because, uh, because when young people have been hurt, particularly by people they trust, um, their expectation is that, that other people have destructive intentions toward them as well. Um, just as and it's so hard for parents who, who have the opposite of destructive intentions, who are trying so hard to help when young people 
have that triggered instinctive um, distrust and and misinterpretation of what we're trying to do. Right? So the more that we use language that connects symptoms and triggers, this is a more of a therapeutic example, but you could probably have the same conversation um, as a parent with a child. So this this was a 10-year-old boy who repeatedly was in trouble in school because he would simply walk out of the classroom without permission. So, so I asked him, what were you feeling when you left? Um, and he's trapped. I had to get out of there. Uh, and I said, wow, what triggered you? And he and he says, I don't think he actually knew what I meant by what triggered you, <laughs> but, but he knew what happened just before he left. The, tree, the teacher had this really mean look, and then she laughed at me. Right? Can you see why that was a trigger? And I say, wow, so people who look mean really scare you, huh? And he says, yeah, but I shouldn't have left because I just got in more trouble. There, <laughs> So often... So often children know that after the fact, but it's hard for anybody to know it when they're in that situation. And then we have to rehearse new options that take into account that teachers are going to have a serious look and that that will be triggering because serious means mean. Um, and who knows why? I'm, who knows why the teacher went from serious to laughing? Unlikely to have anything to do with this child. I'm sure she had a mean look after he left. <laughs> but, but then we have to rehearse new options. You know, we got to figure out what you can do. Because people sometimes do look mean, even when they're not angry. And, and they're going to trigger you. Okay, so, so we have to acknowledge that the triggers are there and, and that they're not something the child can have control over. If I had said, you know, I'm sure your teacher didn't mean it, that wouldn't, that's, that's a thinking brain idea. Um, but when I say, well, we got to figure out what you can do because, you know, People sometimes do look mean when they're serious, when they're tired, when they're grumpy. And we don't want them to trigger you. I don't want you to get in more trouble. So we've got to explicitly acknowledge triggering as the issue behind every problem. I actually think, you know, I, I think it. It, that we would be a much safer, much more harmonious society if we acknowledge that we trigger each other, right? It isn't just the highly traumatized young people. We all trigger each other. But we have to make this the number one issue in families, in programs. Um, and we have to explain that triggering is natural and normal when something bad has happened to you. And again, that's the language that I use, right? When lots of bad things happen, happen to us, it makes us very, very sensitive to getting triggered by the smallest of everyday things. You know, your body is just trying to protect you from possible danger, but it's really, it's really annoying. And what happens when you get triggered? That's, I mean, if you're a family, you know what the child does when, when they get triggered. Um, but, 
they may not actually make the connection between being triggered and running away or being triggered and throwing objects around or hitting um, you or hitting a sibling. Um, and then we have to use the language of triggering, right? Okay, kids, I'm going to make an announcement. I don't mean to trigger everybody. It's not a bad announcement. Um, when we speak sternly or we yell, there's no reason why we can't say, I'm sorry, I was really triggered, right? And I hope it didn't trigger you too much, right? We can say, you know, maybe your sister got triggered by you. <laughs> maybe that's why she's not talking to you. So it's just normal language. In programs like Pine River, you're going to see kids triggering each other all the time. You're going to see children in families triggering other children, getting triggered by other children. And so we have to make this a language that is not, it's not a blame language. It's a human language, right? We all trigger each other. And and we have to keep reiterating. I have to I have to remind myself when I find triggered behavior very difficult to deal with, I have to remind myself this person is just triggered. Um, and then we have to be careful because if I say too quickly, the thing, the one thing that you're responsible for is how you handle your feelings when you get triggered. Because if I say that while the child is triggered, it's going to be triggering. So best, best to take this no blame attitude, to have lots of conversation about how everybody triggers each other, and then ask, right, what do we do when we're triggered? Like, what does mom do? What does dad do? What does your brother do? What does your sister do? What does your friend do? Right? Because, because we don't have to say you're responsible for how you handle uh, it when you're triggered. We can say, you know, we can rate the whole family on how they do when they're triggered. How would you rate yourself? Um... And if no one is to blame for triggering, it's much easier for everyone to take responsibility. And it allows us to anticipate triggers. Um, because often when a traumatized young person has been very impulsive, has been acting out a lot, the other children in the family are now triggered around those holidays, around those occasions um, that have been triggering for the traumatized child. So again, these are conversations that are so important to have because they become the background within which we can set limits. Um, we can say, how can we all do better? when we're triggered. Um, here are some very practical tips, right? Because remember, your young person's thinking brain is not operating well, right? It's kind of like, it's kind of like having a phone that has, it has reception some places and not others. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But we can help the child's thinking brain by asking a menu questions or multiple choice questions, right? And, and asking questions rather than making statements, right? So after the fact, I can ask, when you freak out, what happens? Do you get tense? Do you get scared? Do you get overwhelmed? Um, 
when you feel angry, is it more like energy or strength, or does it want to do something? Um, and a lot of children who are impulsive will say it wants to do something. Yeah, yeah. And so, so yeah, when you feel angry, the anger wants to do something. Um, and then, and then, um, there, we can have a conversation about, yeah, anger's like that. It, it, it always wants to do something. It wants to yell or throw something or, um, or, or tell people they're wrong. And how well does that work? Um, you know, often young people say, I feel nothing because they're numb, not because they're being resistant, um, right? But we can always ask, what does nothing feel like? Does it feel more like calm? Is it, is it foggy? Is it hard as a rock? Or is it just tuning out? Um, or tuning out sounds too intentional. Or does do your feelings just get tuned out? Does that feeling feel good or bad? You know, with young people who are really finding it hard to have words, ask the simplest question, does that feeling feel good or bad? I ask people all the time, when you do this, when when you act out, do you feel better or do you feel worse? When you express how you feel, do you feel better or do you feel worse? Simplest question, pretty non-threatening. When you feel scared, does the danger feel like something that will hurt you from the inside or from the outside? And in some ways, it doesn't matter because what I'm doing is I'm helping the young person to notice. And noticing is comes from this part of the brain, from the medial prefrontal cortex. That's why noticing and curiosity are so important in the treatment of trauma. When you say those words, I hate him, do you feel better? Or do you feel worse? Right? Sometimes young people feel relief when they say, I hate him. Sometimes, probably more often, they feel more activated. So let's talk about some techniques that, um, that you as a family can teach your children and also uh, staff can teach their children, their children, their, the, the young people in their care. Very important idea that comes from sensory motor psychotherapy. Um, because remember, we've got this pesky problem of the thinking brain shutting down. So skill building um, programs, um, tend to not work consistently. Um, sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. Um, discipline, limits, consequences, sometimes work, sometimes are triggering. But one thing that really helps, because again, we got to get this part of the brain online, um, is to ask the child to try an experiment. Okay, let's try a science experiment. I know you're really, really triggered right now, but let's just see what happens if you breathe. Okay, or you what? What I prefer is sigh. We'll, we'll just run it as a science experiment. Right? Because when we're very, 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 very triggered, 
we need things that will help. Um, and when there's something about an experiment, right? So if I say we're just we're just running a science experiment, the child has a sense that there's no wrong or right answer. Uh, because right or wrong answers are very triggering. Um, it actually takes the pressure off family members and staff members because it doesn't mean we have to come up with solutions. We just have to be willing to run scientific experiments. Um, so the key is helping young people to notice that they're triggered because we're talking about triggers and triggering all the time, to notice, does their nervous system go up or does it go down? And then, and then we can experiment with what helps, right? The first thing I usually teach is a little piece of psychoeducation. Um, I teach people of all ages, to just say, I'm triggered, I'm triggered, I'm triggered, I'm really, really triggered, I am so triggered, I'm just triggered. Because that keeps, usually keeps the arousal from escalating or tanking out. If the young person is triggered and is saying, you know, I hate him, that jerk, that asshole, that was unfair, the arousal is going to increase. I'm triggered, I'm triggered, I'm triggered, I'm triggered. We'll at least hold it. Um, curiosity. Again, hard to be curious when we're triggered, but where it's possible. Um, noticing what triggered. Um, noticing body responses. You know, it's so great to work with young people and with adults, helping them to notice the impulse to fight without acting on it. And it can feel actually more powerful. Um, noticing the impulse to run without acting on it. Um, right? So, so, you know, so I could say, you know, you're always getting into trouble for, for throwing things, right? You're always getting into trouble for punching the wall. Um, so could we, could we try an experiment, see if, if, if there's some kind of science experiment we could do that would help you not punch the wall? Because I think it's more triggering when you punch the wall and then you get in trouble, you know, I don't, and I hate to say that I hate to see that, right? Because I don't want you to be in trouble, and I don't want to be the one who punishes you, um, right? So noticing the feeling of wanting to hit, wanting to throw, um, and feeling all that energy can actually feel good. Um, grounding with the feet, feeling your feet on the ground is actually really helpful for low arousal. It can also, it also can be helpful with high arousal. Just feeling like, just stay with your feet, right? right? You feel the triggering and stay with your feet. You know, your feet will not fail you, right? Just, just stay with those feet. Um, the hand on the heart is one of my favorite science experiments because, um, you know, one of the things that, that I'm sure many of you know is that when we're around little babies and they cry, most of us instinctively pick up the baby and bring the baby here because that heartbeat to heartbeat communication is soothing for babies. It's also soothing to 
put your hand on the heart. And that's something the whole family could do. Okay? If things start to get heated at the dinner table, you can you can run an experiment. You could say, okay, each time things get a little bit a little bit heated, I'm gonna do this. And the first person to see me do it too. Right? So that and then it be, can become almost a contest between other members of the family of like who gets the hand to the heart quickest. Um, you know, the hand on the heart can be used in families to prevent fights, you know, um, because, um, because again, it can be a communication as well as a way to calm one's own nervous system. Um, and engaging the core, you know, we all, we all have a core, this area of the midriff, I don't know if you can see right here. Um, and so when we engage the muscles of our core, we actually feel more, more grounded, more centered. Right? So many. Um, this list of resources on the right um, could be used for any of the traumatic reactions on the left. One of my favorite techniques, I love it, is the sigh. That's something else you could do as a whole family. Right? Like, okay, guys, this is the time of day when we all get triggered because we're all tired, right? So let's let's just all sigh. Ah. Because each time you sigh, notice it, try it yourselves. There's a very deep natural inbreath. You don't have to try to breathe in because when you sigh, your lungs do it for you. So it's a much more relaxed experience than, than trying to breathe. Um, tensing and then relaxing. You know, I think we've all had the experience of wanting to say to somebody, just relax, right? Because you can see they're really tense. But it actually works better to say, let's see what happens. If we tense, 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 tense every muscle of your body that you can, and then let it go. I don't actually say relaxing. I say let it go, uh, because relaxing can be a triggering word. Um, and that that often works, right? right? They might, might, we might have to keep repeating it. Okay, let's another, let's do it again. Tense, 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 and let it go. Slowing the pace, right? Slowing everything down. And it only takes one person in the family to slow things down um, or to start that slowing. Because, you know, one of the it's a blessing and a curse that we're very sensitive to contagion. If we're around people who are anxious, we tend to get anxious. When we're around people who are angry, we're more likely to get angry. So if we're around people who are like, and we slow the pace, uh, that's going to be contagious too. Movement. Um, Movement can be great, especially for very numb um, um, young people, very, you know, who are really kind of numb, passive, lost, completely lost their energy. And and you know, again, I would be I would be indirect. I'd say, hey, you know, let's 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 get up and, and, and take a walk or, you know, you know, come with me in the kitchen and, 
and just like it doesn't have to be big movements but just something to get that nervous system going um you know when i'm in an office with clients i often say you know would it be okay with you if we stood up because uh, i'm getting really tired of sitting down i don't make it about them i make it about me i say i'm you know i don't mean to be a pain but really i'm so tired of sitting would it be okay with you if we stood up um lengthening the spine right i'm sure you've noticed uh, because this happens uh, with young people as well as adults is what i it's called the collapse and you see it with depression hopelessness um and the whole range of of emotions and sensations that go with low arousal and so you know you're always talking to somebody's to somebody's head right and they're looking at the floor it can be very frustrating as a parent um so one of the scientific experiments that i love to run is is so i might say to this young person i might say would you be willing to try an experiment that might give you just a a little bit if it works you know it's just an experiment but if it works it might give you just a teeny bit more energy right and then i said so let's lengthen the spine from the lower back up and you know if i are feeling hopeless as a parent i do this you know when i feel hopeless as a therapist i'll do this lengthening the spine from the very bottom of my spine not i always say to clients don't sit up straight the way your grandmother might have told you <laughs> right just lengthen your spine from the lower back up and and you know i think it actually that's a good one for you as a parent too because i know when i have when i have clients who are putting me down who are angry at me accusing me of being cold and uncaring and narcissistic and um and not understanding it really helps me to lengthen my spine because then i feel i feel more supported by by my own body um and then grounding of course is feeling our feet um you know even if your young person is not willing to do any of these which could be the case i've certainly had clients who would say, who would say that's stupid i'm not doing that that was just a scientific experiment right i mean some scientific experiments are stupid but you know <laughs> what's the harm no i'm not doing that so i then if they're not doing it i'm using the resources because they will help me and that's one of the things that i think it's very very important is that our windows of tolerance need help too um just by a no always demonstrate the skills and resources first um and actually i would do them myself um um you know in in the view of the child so that it's clear these are not stupid um i use them you can use them or not um being told to use them will be triggering um as being watched is often triggering for young people so i always pay more attention to my demonstration that to what the client is doing and i try to make it playful and fun um which can be hard if you're not feeling like this is fun right <laughs> right right and demonstrate using the skills 
okay. But I got my hand on my heart, right? I'm just taking a few minutes to sigh without asking the young person to. Remember the contagion effect. You're breathing, your hand is on your heart. That's going to have an indirect effect of calming the child a little bit. Um, use, describe the skills as something we can do to feel better when we're triggered or stressed. Because as much as it's true that traumatized young people engage in bad behavior, it's triggering to use that language. So much better to talk about these are things that help people when they're triggered or when they're stressed out. Now, I think one of the hardest things is, is what I call discipline without threat, right? Because sometimes the behavior isn't just inappropriate. It's unacceptable, it's dangerous, it's extreme. And, and sometimes it's violent and therefore frightening for families. One of the things that's the hardest is that the natural tendency of most parents is to either give in or get angry. The hardest thing for us to do is to hold our ground without threat or anger. Um, sometimes it's hard to hold, I mean, you know, I remember as a parent, it was very hard for me to hold my ground unless I was angry. Giving in doesn't provide enough structure to bring that consistency that traumatized kids need. And of course, when we're angry and we use the language of punishment, we're going to be triggering. So, and again, I, I say this without, without blame. Because I think we don't say often enough that giving in is the natural reaction of a parent, right? All right? Um, unless we get to the point where we feel so angry, we get hard. So the more that we can be flexible and consistent and firm but calm, now that's a tall order when, when your child is punching walls, hurting members of the family, hurting themselves. Um, right? It's very hard, but consistently we can use the language of triggering um, and avoid the language of fault. Um, we can take responsibility for discipline. I think back and I remember uh, saying to my adolescent children, you're grounded with all kinds of fault in my voice and my facial expression. Um, now, I would say, in this family, um, we... There are consequences. I, I remember there was a time in my children's life where we had family court, right? Because it wasn't working to keep grounding them. It wasn't working to have long, patient conversations. So we had family court. And, and, and we would, you know, so there would be a, um, what, a, a crime, not really, some kind of event that had to come before family court. We heard from the various witnesses. <laughs> and then I would ask the, the child, the teenager, I would say, what do you think the consequences should be? Um, right? let's, let's discuss as a family, including the the, uh, the the criminal <laughs> and and it was very it was actually very effective because when 
the discipline was decided by the family court, um, there was much less reactivity to it. So I want to say a few things. Oh, good, we have time about what I call trauma-informed uh, communication. Uh, but I think we've talked about acknowledging the past, right? It's hard for kids to trust when they've been hurt by people, right? It's hard for kids to trust their own families when somebody has hurt them. Um, understanding the role of triggering, taking the no blame attitude, um, speaking the language of the nervous system rather than you, right? Instead of you freaked out, you know, your nervous system totally freaked out. And trying as much as we can to find positive interventions. That's what family court was trying to do. Uh, it was very time consuming though, I must say. Always keep in mind the situation to which this young person had to adapt and survive, um, right? They overreact to our words and our body language because traumatic experience is the experience of seeing very slight changes suddenly become dangerous. Um, right? The fact that your young person had the experience of adults who seem to take satisfaction in hurting or humiliating them um, is, you know, is there in their cells, not necessarily in their minds. So we have to make sure that our body language and facial expressions um, appear as safe as possible to the child. Um, so play with your voice. You know, uh, Daniel Hughes, who is one of the Canadian, I must, I think, isn't he? Um, who is the world expert on reactive attachment disorders, attachment disorders in traumatized kids, says the voice is the most powerful way of regulating the nervous system, right? So play with how you use your voice. Um, experiment with your facial expressions. What does this young person respond best to? Um, when your energy level is bigger, does that get a, does that get a better effect? or when your energy is pulled back or quieter? Is this a child who responds to empathy? Some young people, especially teenage boys, um, are humiliated by empathy. Um, and they may do better with very sort of little challenges. Um, is this a child who responds better when you're playful or better when you're serious. There's some scientific experiments right there. Um, does it help this child to encourage emotional expression? That seems to be the trend in most, um, in most programs for children with behavior problems, is the encouragement of getting in touch with their feelings and expressing their feelings rather than behaving impulsively. Um, but for some traumatized kids, the emotions are too overwhelming. So that backfires. Um, oh, and I forgot, very important. Um, connect these young people to their resources. And I don't mean the resources we've been talking about so much as well, what do you see in them that is good, that is um, that is 
admirable, but has um, potential. Uh, what book do they like? What what gives them pleasure? Um, sometimes it's hard to tell, but the more we connect to what's meaningful to the young person, not just to what's meaningful for us, um, that really helps. Um, experiment with being as curious as you can. I have found curiosity to be one of the most powerful interventions, right? Especially after a child has acted out. Wow, let's be curious. It's very hard to say when your heart is pounding and you're you're freaking out. Um, but the more curiosity we're able to demonstrate, the more the capacity of the child to reflect will become. Um, the problem is that we humans are designed so if somebody else goes into an emergency response, our emergency response systems also get activated. So when a child goes into a fight or flight response, we start pumping adrenaline. Um, and, and because of the contagion effect, often the young people can feel it. Even though we have a much better ability to speak rationally, even when our hearts are pounding and the adrenaline is pumping. Um, so one of the things to remember is what I call the oxygen mask principle, right? That's the instruction you get on the airplane. If you're with someone who needs your help, Put your own oxygen mask on first before helping others. So the first line of intervention is to calm our own nervous systems. Again, you can't help it, right? This is just how the brain and body works. Just think it helped the cavemen and women. If one member of the tribe got frightened, everybody got frightened. If one started to run, everybody started to run. That probably saved a lot of lives. Russell Mears is an expert from Australia. He says, not only are we unconsciously influenced by his slight and subliminal signals, so also is, I'll say, the young person. Details of our posture, gaze, tone of voice, even respiration are unconsciously recorded and processed. A sophisticated therapist or parent or family member may use this processing in a beneficial way without or in addition to the use of words. When you're out of words to say, when, you're, when you've had it, Use your posture, gaze, tone of voice, even your breathing. Um, because of that contagion effect. Um, and Dan Hughes reminds us of the four most powerful ingredients, hard to come by in a crisis, but very important. The more we can bring them to the table, the better. Playfulness, acceptance, curiosity, and empathy. Many families may feel like they've lost their playfulness. And it's hard enough to, to accept and have empathy. But the more we can bring playfulness to our interactions, even in the most extreme situations, the better it will be for both family and child. So